All right. Well, I have the top of the hour, so I'm going to begin things right now. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest talking about a really powerful topic. I'm very much excited about our conversation. Our guest is, a, I'm a big fan of his. Stephen is someone that has an incredible spirit. He is extremely playful, extremely thoughtful, deeply committed to open, and is an active leader and activist in all of these fields. So at his university, he's been doing all kinds of great stuff, reaching out with a local uh, museum to do a fantastic archive of play and games. He's been doing a lot of work on today's topic on open, leading the first university portfolio on this and being an activist, organizing people around the world. So without any further ado, let me just bring up on stage, on stage if I can't say it, our guest, Stephen Jacobs. Greetings, Professor okay. Jacobs. Now I'm here. Yay. Um, yes, hi, folks. Uh, open is a big topic, and it's kind of a, a big, it's kind of an octopus. And so I will, with your kind indulgence, take a couple of minutes to work from the, RI, the RIT example to, to address how we got here and how the different aspects of open affect the students, faculty, staff in this university. Yes, but before you do that, I have to show people something and I have to ask you a question. Okay. The question is, to give people a better sense of who you are, I mean, obviously you've got an amazing visual background right now, which is making me very happy, um, but tell us what you're going to be working on for the next year. What are the topics, what are the projects that are uppermost for you? So for the next year, um, will be continuing to support faculty, staff, and students in, in doing open science, open scholarship, open source work, those types of things. We're kind of, we don't have any power to command that RIT pursue A, B, C, or D processes or policies. So if you go to the Open at RIT website, you'll see we have a bunch of best practices information and, and that type of thing. Um, that will still continue to occupy some of my time, including teaching in what are the only, what's the only open source academic minor in the world, which is what hmm. we're here for teaching students how to be better community members and managers in open source. So it's not a, oh. a technical set of classes as much as it is a, how to be a good citizen and how to work well with others in that context, in that space. Wow. Um, so those are like one chunk of time. The other chunk of time is with the Strong National Museum of Play, where I've had a dual appointment for 16 years. Um, I have a whole totally divergent set of research on 200 years of uh, designers, engineers, inventors in the toy and game space who are Jewish, which is not something, you know, the the... Jewish contributions to Hollywood and, and comic books and those kinds of things have been around for a while. This one is much less known. So I'll be, yeah. I'll be yeah. off of teaching and other things in the fall to, to try to finish pounding on a book on that and to be working with um, the strong on an exhibit will mount on that topic and open probably at the end of 2025. Oh, very cool. I would love to see that. It, it's it's a great museum, by the way, if you ha if you haven't been to it. Uh, I heard about this for years, traveling across upstate New York, and I finally got to it. It was just a joy. Um, you know, a strong museum of, of games and play is just a national treasure. And you have to come back because we added another 90,000 square feet during COVID and opened it last year. Whoa! Yes. In terms of it's on video games. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll be there. Well, th I, I mentioned that was a question I wanted to ask. And then I also want to point people to two buttons on the screen. If you look in the bottom left, you should see kind of tan colored buttons. One that says uh, Helios and one says open work. If you click on the open work button, it'll take you to a definition of open work. And if you click on the Helios button, it'll take you to a project. Well, Steve, I think you'll be about to describe this. But uh, I'm on. happy to talk about both of them. Um, <laughs> Tell, tell us about the octopus first. What, what, are, what are the different limbs? And uh, is there a pincer? Okay, so the, the pincer or, or the, the center of gravity is the word open. 
right? And open source is a method of software development. And it, it uses the word source because obviously you write source code in a programming language and then you compile it to an application. So in the computer world, what's opening the source means giving everybody the recipe and all the ingredients to cook their own. So when software is truly open source, um, you should be able to fix, modify, duplicate, depending on the license. And the license is a quagmire in itself. What started with a handful of licenses has become hundreds of licenses as everybody um, rolls their own to fit their own balance of, well, I want people to be able to do X or not Y with my mm -hmm. um, okay. software. Probably the best way to talk about open source and its licenses in brief is more of you are more likely familiar with the Creative Commons licensing practice. Sure. Where you go to a website and you say, I do or don't want people to be able to use this to make money, at least not without bouncing that money back to me. I do or don't want people to be able to duplicate this without my knowledge and with, or at least without giving me attribution for being the person who originally created it. I do or don't want to require people that if they make a version of my stuff, they have to push those changes back to the general public or to me, right? You have these three, four, five questions. Are most of you familiar with that? Am I making sense? I think if, you, if, if folks can say this in the chat, um, if you're familiar with uh, Creative Commons and these kind of alternative licenses, please do. Uh, I'm actually going to put a, uh, a link in the chat to uh, a couple of our sessions that we've done on, uh, on, on copyright and uh, Creative Commons. Okay, great. I, I'm seeing a lot of yeses, so I won't dive deeper. All of this comes from open source originally and the larger known Creative Commons stuff. Um, comes from the fact that copyright is either all on or all off, right? Either I own the rights to everything that I have copyrighted and everybody has to come to me individually to negotiate a deal to use my stuff or it's in the public domain and I don't care who does what with it. Just don't bother me if you have a problem with it, right? <laughs> that makes sense. So, Open source software came about because back in the original history of software, all software was free. You bought the mainframe and the software was like an add-on. And then software became its own business. And so all of these questions of liability, responsibility, remuneration of that piece of IP have built an entire structure around how you can have as much or as little control over your own software as you want based on the license. Is everybody with me so far on these arcane IP issues? I think so. I think a lot of people here are uh, we've got right. a good number of activists and uh, um, and again, if you have uh, if you have questions about these, um, you know, hit the question you know button on the very bottom of the screen and, and we'll bring that up. All right. So I'm going to stay in the open source lane for a little bit longer, and then I'm going to broaden it out into the other opens, right? So I began teaching open source uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I'm a game professor. I am totally unqualified for any of the things that I do. I have a, a, B, a BA in liberal arts and MA in media studies. And somehow I am a full professor in one of the largest colleges of computing on the planet. Um, <laughs> And so for me, I had heard about open source. You know, it all sounded like this very kind of close to the metal, very complicated types of programming to build operating systems that I had no interest, no knowledge, and no desire to know anything more about. And then this thing came along. Since I happen to have 20 of them or so that I'm about to give back wow. to the organization, so yeah. this is the One Laptop Per Child XO, the MIT envisioned $100 laptop in its original phase yeah. for 
areas in the world, countries, cities, states that did not have solid infrastructure of any kind, right? The idea was is that if you are in a one room schoolhouse in the Middle East, in somewhere in the region of Africa, wherever, you're probably as a child, you're probably in a one room schoolhouse serving multiple grades and a, a schoolhouse that it's not fit to sit in in the summers because it's too hot, you're cooler outdoors. So that cool thing has all kinds of technology that allows it to use Wi-Fi if it can find it, have people connect peer to peer if they can't so kids can collaboratively work on stuff. And it was meant to be a replacement for what rich industrial nations have in their schools, things like a library and an art room and a music room and science labs that hopefully this would fill the gap. And that became, and that was released as open source software for the operating system and the applications and open source hardware so that the hardware could be worked on independently anywhere or added to or so on and so forth. And as a games professor, when this was coming out, I wanted my game students to be able to build educational games for that platform. That then led to all of these other open source courses at the university and my trying to get people to collaborate on, on open projects and mainly with a humanitarian focus. Um, nice. There's a, you, a couple of people in the chat, by the way, uh, our, our wonderful Al Naveen says that he has one, which quote, it worked last time I opened it, unquote. Uh, it, they still work, whether the software is current anymore, what you have to do, what kind of software machinations you have to jump through a hoop to, to make it, you know, actually functional. We, we had trouble with, you know, our IT entity at the university wanting to just whitelist all of them and not officially let them onto the networks when students were working on them. In fact, the reason I have had at 1.60 of them was that, you know, yeah. computing yeah. infrastructure guru said, don't put any of that nasty stuff on our networks. And I set up a Hail Mary to the open source world and they drop shipped me 30 units so that I could give them to the students to work on them in the class. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's a divergence. Anyway, um, to manage the complexities of open source and IP and contributions, there is an entity in the commercial world, your Amazons, your Facebooks, your so on and so forth, yeah. called an open source programs office. They help legal manage the licenses, be in compliance with whatever software they're using that came from somewhere else write the rules and regs for their employees to contribute to projects outside of their own ecosystem, so on and so forth. Everybody still with me? I think so. Is that, uh, is that something that your own office works on? So we became the second academic OSPO on a university campus. The Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Long May They Wave, decided that they wanted to increase academic participation in open source by funding some open source programs offices at universities. I uh, think I saw Lorena Barba pop in here. She was in the yeah. second or third wave of yeah. loan grants at George Washington. So they have an mm -hmm. OSPO now. Even that said, some of these OSPOs at universities are very focused as the corporate ones are uh, ideally uh, just on software generated by and or used and modified by their employees, right? So they're very software mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. Does that makes sure. sense? Yeah. Um, others are broader. I run probably the first one that was focused on a broader mission and it has to do with all of the opens and the, the definition of open work. Okay. And I'm, I'm coming to this because the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which I understand most of you should know about by now, NASEM, right? Um, they wanted to put a focus on what they were calling open scholarship. 
And one of the problems we have in the open world is merging and blending of the lines, the wires, the definitions, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Often you will now hear somebody say, I'm going to open source my textbook. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, they can't open source is very specific about software and source code. And there's an entity called the OSI that owns that definition and manages it and decides out of all of these licenses that people are propagating on the side, which ones are really legit open source licenses by their definition and which ones are not. Right. And this level of complexity is one of the reasons why when you go to the Creative Commons site, you will see them say, please do not use our licenses for software. Hmm. Hmm. Software is open source and go here. Um, so this, so there's this one challenge of the blurring of the lines of what open source mm -hmm. officially means and what has become to mean. It's almost like a trademark defense mm. suit that has not gone well, right? Mm. And it's kind of open source and everything. When NASM three or four years ago decided they wanted to build entities that would help cohese and enable what they were calling open scholarship, the two sentences in the letter that they sent out to presidents and provosts said something like this. We want to support open scholarship, right? Parentheses, which some people call open research and some people call open science, right? Like a big asterisk. It was a, and then it says, and by that, of course, next says, and by that, we're also mean that this effort is inclusive of the arts and the professions and the blah, but we're going to call it open scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I was charged, when I was financed and funded, thank you, Alfred P. Sloan's Foundation, um, to build this entity at RIT, I specifically called open at RIT an open programs office, no source. And I wanted to talk about open work because I did not want to be exclusive, right? I didn't want my artist colleagues to say, you know, I do applied stuff. There's nothing you can help me with because I don't do research or I don't do scholarship or I don't do science, right? Or, you know, the, the guys who are in the humanities who say, well, you know, I kind of really don't do open science, right? That's the night, not the right word. So we created this open work definition to try to get people to use open work. So we had an equal ground that no matter where all of you in the room here are from in terms of your work disciplines, you would ideally say, I do open work in humanities. I do open work in the arts. I do open work here, there, or everywhere. And so we're all clear about what we're, where we're equal and where we specialize. And so that's where, that's where that definition comes from. So that is the new name of the octopus is open work. Well, if I had my way, uh, there's a lot of other entities who have not embraced this and anointed me with sainthood and so on and so forth. But, wow. but around my backyard, this is what we use. And in places that I'm active, if I say this, people know what I mean. And, um, and, and, if, and if you click on the button, you can, you can find that site. But Stephen, we, we have questions already coming in. Well, and come on down and then I'll, I'll keep going down the track. What are the questions? Yeah. One of them has to add a limb to your uh, delightful octopus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I think we need props for this, actually. Um, but this is, uh, this is from our friend Lisa Sieverts at Harvard. And she says, I know that most open source software projects are very high quality, but I'm curious about how you answer the inevitable questions about quality in open teaching resources. Right. Or so so when, when you look at the list of open work, you'll see we include OERs there. Um, Anything that is open is buyer beware, right? As is anything your university produces, right? They immediately say, hey, mm. here's this thing. And by the way, here's the liability clause. If you put this on your computer, if you 
you know, swallow it if you whatever, right? We are not responsible. We're just saying it's up to you, right? Hmm. And in fact, hmm. unfortunately, there's a practice called kind of open washing, mm -hmm. right? Where a company, say Apple with Swift or Microsoft with .NET, right? Well, they, they, where will they, they will say to themselves, you know, this is kind of getting old and we don't want to be bothered maintaining it anymore. So we're going to put it under an open license. God bless you. And, you know, we're going to look to you to keep this running. If it's important to you to keep it running and please don't call us anymore. <laughs> so, you know, quality is rarely um, something that is guaranteed. In fact, one of the things, the quality is most often based on the quality of the community behind it. Mm. And so one of the things that we teach the students who take our first open source course is go take a look at the community, right? You know, I'm going to want you to make contributions to this. I'm going to want you to put your time and effort into doing something with this group. How do you know that they're a group that's worth your time, right? Here's how you figure out how active they are. Um, how many bugs do they have listed that have been there for four mm -hmm. years and no one's addressed, right? If you send them an email saying you want to help with something, do you hear back in 24 hours or 24 days, right? You know, we have a whole checklist we make them go through as a group three times for three different types of projects kind of defined uh, in the book, um, Working in the Open, which is about the history and the current practices in open source. And that author defines um, four different types one is um basically a koi right this is somebody's private project and nobody really pays that much attention to it except three guys and whatever um mm -hmm. there is a hobby which doesn't necessarily mean that it's small but means it's kind of in the old open source structure and that pretty much anybody can trick can contribute to any piece of it and there's a very flat org chart does that make sense? I think everyone knows what a flat org chart is. Um, yeah, and, and wishes they had a flatter one at their university, I'm also sure. Depending on what um, yeah. So the other two categories they talk about, one is um, a stadium. Say again? A stadium, like a sports stadium. Thank you. Thank you. Whereas theoretically, it's open for you to look at and request features from and things like that but there's really only a small core of people who are empowered to do any work on it now, stadiums are often the case in large corporate open source things where you know with the 80 20 rule 80 percent of what's done is done by a small select group of employees right and then there's what they refer to as a federation which is something that's got a very wide and deep org chart there are different people focused on different people different aspects of the project who are managing things through a larger top level vision but it's been encapsulated for efficiency or less efficiency depending on your point of view of that work so i have the students look at a hobby a stadium and a federation and decide whether or not this looks like a functional group that they'd want to engage with. Does mm. that help with your quality question, Lisa? Or Lisa, to lay out the problem? <laughs> if you if you want to uh, if you Lisa if you want to respond either by uh, by in the chat box or if you want to add another question or if you want to join us on stage, just click your the raised hand button uh, to say more. But thank you for the question, if, if, friends. If you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of a Q and A box question. So all you have to do is head to the bottom of the screen. Find that little uh, question mark button and, and hit it and type in your question. Um, while Lisa's thinking about this and while everybody else is thinking about it, Stephen, we have a, another question which goes back a couple of limbs in your octopus. Okay, I'll take it. And this is from uh, our, our reliable deep questioner, uh, Tom Haynes, um, coming to us from the Houston area. And he asks, how do these open work initiatives create incentives for interdisciplinary research and collaboration? Um, I paid Tom a digital dollar under the hood so he would ask this question because it, it leads it. into that Helios button that you guys have, 
Helios stands for Higher Education Leadership in Open Scholarship. Open Scholarship because it comes out of NASM versus the federal government, which talks more often about open science. Yes. So um, getting this stuff to work in a university is a challenge, right? Because a lot of those incentives tie directly to te you know, higher tenure and promotion policies, right? So uh, one of the examples I, I tend to use to illustrate the challenges is, I assume most of you know what R is, the statistical language and package that's open source. There you go. So when, um, especially administrators ask me about this, you know, I will say to them, who knows what R is? And they'll go, oh, well, it's fantastic. It's all time. And then I'll say, what happens if R falls apart and people go, oh my God, my world would collapse. I could never do my work again. And then I say, what if I told you that a professor dedicates most of his time to helping R stay up and running, he gets zero credit from his university, despite how key a piece of that is to how academia and research works this day, unless he's writing journal articles about it, or going to academic peer-reviewed conferences, Presenting. or even more, if he's not getting grant money to contribute to R, he's wasting his time, at least in one point of view. So do you really want to tell the guy who's keeping this stuff propped up that he's wasting his time? So Helios and Mason are very focused on trying to get colleges and universities to figure this out not just across cross-disciplinary projects, but even in people's own lanes, right? How do we unbreak the broken stuff? And it's really, you know, it's a challenge in that it needs to be, it's, it's, a, it's a culture question as well as it's an HR question and a promotion question. And it kind of has to be addressed from both top and bottom. Right, because if you look at an institution like RIT, um, RIT at the top level has this hand wavy tenure and promotion policy that says there should be one that generally uses recognized norms, have at it colleges, right? So it's for the college to deal with this, right? And then at the colleges, you're at the mercy of the given promotion committees within that college, the given promotion policies within, within the governance of that college, right? So it, it gets very divisive very quickly because we have this problem with a lot of professors who look like me that either don't understand this stuff or want everybody's life to be just as difficult as there was when they were a young professor, right? Yeah. So, um, so you really need champions up and down the food chain. Hmm. And, and it's tough. It's, it's hard stuff. You know, um, my current president asked me to be the university representative to Helios. Normally Helios requires presidents, provosts, VPs of research or directors of libraries to be the university representative. And despite the fact that he asked me to do this stuff, every time I talk to him about how we really need to think about open in this context or that context, he always comes back to me with, science is always open publish your stuff, you go to a conference, you're done, that's it. Well, what are they all talking about? Why does this matter? Why is the federal government so concerned? Um, so even though he's asked me to do this work with this organization, he neither understands or values the work that he's asked me to do. Um, this is not uncommon. And, and with my colleagues, I will point to the 
the guidance memo from the Office of Science and Technology Policy from several years ago, the, the Nelson memo, as I believe it's referred to, that says you need to do a much better job of openly publishing, distributing, and crediting the work done in science. And most of them don't want to hear it. Some of them will come to say, I'm really engaged. How do I do this? And most of them take the kind of RIT presidential, eh, I don't have to do anything different. I do all this, this stuff already. Um, so I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, Tom, but if that's a start, great. And tell me what else you need. It sounds like, um, as usual, Tom has just unpeeled something and discovered a, a great deal of complexity that we need to be thinking about. Um, and you've you've shown us that the, the excellent octopus needs to have a good PR agent to work with uh, um, all of these people. Tom, if please please keep thinking about this. We'd love to hear more from you. But we have other questions that have come in, Steve, and I want to make sure that, that people get a chance to please. ask. Uh, this is one coming to us from uh, Armenia, our good friend, Brent Anders, the uh, world guru of uh, AI literacy, has a question about AI, and it goes like this. What are your thoughts on the importance of academic institutions using open source large language model AIs housed within their own IT framework to help ensure increased data safety and security? I, I would just add that's as opposed to relying on a commercially provided AI solution such as OpenAI's ChatGPT or Google's Gemini, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to segue briefly because I saw Ruben's face and I haven't seen Ruben in at least a decade, so I'm going to wave to Ruben. Oh. Um, but the whole AI model is, is a big, big, big can of worms. And um, if you talk to most people in open source, um, they will tell you that there are no open source language models or ones that are, or ones that are open are too small to have the impact that you really need to have. Um, some people in the open source world say, you know, the OSI is trying to come up with the, those open source license people are trying to come up with an open source or an open AI licensing scheme. And they will say, you know, it's not just about writing a spec, you have to have models that people can implement against to make this work and having the size and the scale of the models that folks like um, OpenAI and the other big buzzword companies have, you need massive amounts of computing power and time and energy put into it to make them. And they will say that there are no open LLL, LLMs of consequence at the moment. Um, it, it is a active battleground. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know how you get universities to use it. Getting universities to use open at all is often a struggle just because they, they believe that de facto by something being open, it's insecure and they're leaving themselves open to attacks which is why I ended up with 30 OLPC XOs because my own folks didn't want to put open software on their network back in the day. Um, it's, it's a, a deep dive just in itself, the whole open AI and open LLM area. And I gotta be honest, I am not deep enough into that dive to provide guidance. It's a mess. We've been uh, we've been holding a few sessions on this. Uh, you mentioned Ruben Puente Dura, uh, our good friend and uh, major ed tech visionary and leader, and uh, he helped us with at least one session on it. Um, but it's definitely controversial. Uh, I, I hear the people with a similar background, the similar mentality would say either um, uh, Meta's uh, most recent release is a triumph of open source, and people say no, it's not open source; it's the opposite. Uh, in the chat, um, Brent responds by saying it would require more work by the educational institution. That's for sure. Uh, so, I mean, we've, Stephen, we've, we've hit on, after you've taken us through many limbs of the open work octopus, Lisa's taken us to OER, Tom has taken us to the social collaboration problem, Brent has taken us to the AI issue, 
Now we have a question from Harper College's Christopher Thomas Dobson, who has another question about AI, but from a different angle, impacting open. With the onset of generative AI, how do you see it impacting open work and its use for authoring customized engaging content with accessible interactions with open source formats like hsp.org? So let me, let me put that back up on the screen because that's, yeah. that's a rich question. There's a lot going there. Please, please go ahead. So part of it, Christopher, goes back to which open work and how is it licensed? Right, so going back to our Creative Commons model, is, is the license one that requires that changes be propagated back upstream, that the original creator of the work gets access to and everyone else who is used it gets access to the changes or improvements made? Um, that's certainly unanswered. You have the, WG, the WGA suing all of the large LLM manufacturers for training their stuff on co you know, copyrighted works, right? Um, so all of the open, I mean, all of the LLMs, open or not open, have, have created so many questions about rights, responsibilities, about what are they even being trained on? Because one issue around an LLM is what did you train it on? Which nobody wants to tell you what they've trained it on. Yeah. And there are people discovering that, you know, some of these LLMs for images were trained inadvertently, but, you know, on child pornography databases, among other things, right? The, it, it's just, it's, it's so much a case in many ways, unfortunately, of locking the barn door after the horse is gone. Mm. Um, mm. And this is, I'm sorry to say, you know, a common technology problem, right? The people who solve the problem without first understanding the problem, right? That they've, they haven't, they, they're in this arena of, can I get my tech to do this without having an understanding of the ocean full of octopuses that are all interconnected. Um, you know, I'll go back to Lisa's OERs and her question there, you know, there's this wonderful initiative uh, propagated by the UN and UNICEF and other folks um, called Digital Public Goods. Have folks heard about this? Digital Public Goods. Can you can you say a bit more about that? Um, so it is the concept kind of building on Lisa's question and problem, right? It's that a digital public good is an open work, be it software technology for running a network or a series of open textbooks or what have you, anything that might be used in education, either administratively or as content, right? Hmm. That, that, hmm. that you, if you have an openly licensed piece of stuff, you can answer a questionnaire on the DPG Alliance's website and get certified as a digital public good. Mm. This generally means that, you know, it's it's openly licensed, it has some kind <coughs> of legitimate impact. If, if you search on DPG and digital public goods, you can find the, the form that the checklist that people have to check off and say, yes, I own the rights. Yes, here's how I license them. Here's what this software does all these kinds of things, right? Um, and the challenge I keep putting to the folks who run the DPG efforts that they haven't satisfactorily answered is where is the tech support? For this? <laughs> oh, no. where's, where's the maintenance for this stuff? Uh, and where do people go? This is why companies like Microsoft and Oracle have lock-in all around the world is they can say, well, you may not like my stuff that much, but I at least can point you into direction by how it might get fixed or how you might install it, or how you might implement it. And those questions and the questions of quality that Lisa brought up are, are much vaguer on this DPG side. 
and and I keep going to the DPG folks and saying so. There was, there was a a brief moment in time where there was an open source games console licensed, created and licensed by a company called Ura. That was a big Kickstarter thing that generated all this money, uh-huh. and the logic was there's all these Android games already out there. There's this whole massive corpus of Android games. Let's just build some hardware that you can download Android games to and plug into your TV and have controllers so you can play them on your TV. And there's a marketplace and people charge for it or they give away for free and blah, blah, blah. And efforts like this miss Sturgeon's Law. And for those of you who don't know Sturgeon's Law, it's a, it's a corollary to Murphy's Law. Sturgeon was a science fiction writer of renown and someone came up to him at a conference one day and said, 90% of science fiction is crap. And Sturgeon replied, 90% of everything is crap. And that is Sturgeon's law. And the URA um, collapsed under its own weight due to the fact that there was no quality control and no consistency. Um, for a brief moment in time, Blockbuster rented out Um, interactive media, games and Mm -hmm. entertainment titles, as well as videos in one form or another. And after a year or two, they had to shut it down because they couldn't keep up with the tech support issues, Mm. right? Because everybody who's bought a third party PC, you don't know Mm -hmm. what hardware, you know, what what hard drive manufacturer or CD-ROM manufacturer they went to on week X. And so you try to, you have to install your interactive media, which would then, you know, blow up because this driver didn't work or that driver didn't work. And they were losing money on trying to do tech support. And most tellingly, the last blockbuster to stop offering rental of interactive media and games was in San Francisco because there the population was generally technical enough to solve their own driver issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So quality control spans the is the educational content of this correct, reliable, and up-to-date to to will it run on all the different platforms it needs to run on? So there's this gap between aspiration and implementation. There were, for going back to that small laptop that I waved in front of the video camera, right? Yeah. What killed this is it was a problem, cre- it, was, it was a solution created primarily by academics and technicians. It, there's, a, there's a great book called Learning to Save the World. It's a deconstruction of the whole L- OLPC issue mm. and why it worked and why it didn't work. And they created this solution and determined that these items would only be sold, they'd be sold to a school board, uh, an educational ministry within a country, whatever, that they would contract for them, but there would be child ownership. What does that mean? That means that you didn't buy 30 to put in a closet for your whole school forever you had to buy new ones every year for every incoming kid so they could take it with them. So that it was theirs so that their family and their family mm-hmm. network would benefit from that device being in the home. Yes. Um, and they didn't consider the fact that, well, you know, there were plenty of governmental agencies that couldn't afford it. Yeah. They didn't take into consideration the fact that in many places around the world, um, the ruling hierarchy does not want people of the female gender to have access to technology. Um, they didn't figure out that um, lots of instructors around the world are chalk and talk, repeat what I've written on the board instruction model folks. And the last thing they wanted to do was learn a new computer interface that was designed for kids when all they knew was Windows and that was all they ever wanted to learn about using a computer at all, right? So all of these things and more kind of 
had, you know, I mean, they distributed two or three million of them. So it's, it's not a total failure, but it didn't go where they wanted it to go because technologists answered the question without asking yeah. what the users might want, right? And we have this similar problem with AI or not open AI or digital public goods or whatever. There isn't, there isn't considering the impact of the ripples after you drop the pebble into the pond, right? Mm, 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 mm. Um, in, in, in the chat, uh, Lorena Barba says we need more editors and reviewers. Um, Lorena is correct. Well, um, that's that's why one of the we at Open at RIT in the last semester, so we've been writing a lot of policy stuff. One of the reasons that the federal government is so um, excited about open science and open scholarship is they hope to have that put a dent in the reproducibility gap that we have in science. A stuff isn't being peer reviewed for any number of reasons. Um, and that therefore more and more faulty or bogus science is getting out there and hopefully open science and open scholarship will help defer that. One of the policy papers that we wrote was people should pay for peer review and not that people should pay. I'm Professor Jacobs and give me 200 bucks and I'll review your paper, but more at the university level that institutions are not incentivizing professors to do that service work. Let me, right. The, so, the, so the thought was, let me just finish it. The thought we propagated was if folks like the NSF gave the institution a chunk of money to have professors A, B, and C get X course releases for Y papers reviewed, then that's cash flow into the university and the university ideally would up the value of professors doing peer review when it comes to their review and their promotion and all those other things. It won't, it won't get as raised, you know, it's not going to be, hey, you got a million dollar grant or, hey, you reviewed 10 papers, right? But yeah. if, if you were able to balance those scales a little bit better, maybe that would be one arrow in the quiver to dealing with reproducibility and peer review issues. Because nobody does peer review anymore, right? You know, journal editors are looking for 20 to 30 people these days to find three who will try to squeeze in a peer review. Oh, this is this is a hard one, and we haven't we haven't talked about uh, open scholarship, open uh, scholarship, and uh, scholarly publication yet. But let me, let me let me pull back from that for a second, especially since the um, we seem to have a pause in the in the number of questions. I'm wondering right now, based on your experience, both on your research but also your experience at RIT, what advice would you give to colleges and universities now on how best to support open work? Is having an office like yours the best solution or what else should they be doing? Um, having an office like mine can certainly help or, or like Lorena's, right? But it's, it's the cultural change. It, it all, according to Helios anyway, which has over a hundred members of folks from different institutions around the country right? Because it's kind of an offshoot of work that Mason has been doing. It all comes back to first addressing recruitment, tenure, and promotion. Getting people who understand these models into the, the mainstream of the university and rewarding them and the people who are remaking themselves in Open Scholars. Mm. Walking away from the if it's not in the top three peer reviewed journals, which you can't get numbers in really until you've had your paper out for five years. So enough people have had an opportunity to replicate, right? If, if we can't walk away from this mindset, then we can't fix the problem. There's another entity out there um, called SF DORA. It stands for the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. So those last two words, research assessment are a big piece of the problem. And they have been working and doing great work in terms of um, documenting, promoting, trying to encourage people to pursue 
models of assessment that are more equitable and more favorable to open work. And um, it really requires institutional will to change and stakeholders up and down the org chart who are willing to do the work to make that change happen. Um, and that means you've got to work on a new incentive structure before you get incentivized for doing so. Okay. And just just as a final note, to as a games professor in a college of computing, we had to write essentially a rider to our tenure and promotion policy within the college of computing and get it approved by the then dean and provost that said, you know, people who make games don't get papers in the top three peer reviewed journals, right? Our dissemination, our impact, all these things are measured differently. We're not saying you shouldn't expect us to have dissemination and impact, but you've mm -hmm. got to understand and look at how those boxes get checked in our field. Mm -hmm. Well, let me turn that question around because I mean, I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, just working with the entire org chart of a, of an institution and that's, that's daunting, but, but doable, but let's, let's, let's imagine that at let's imagine a hypothetical university where that's true where we've accomplished that and it's it's 2025 say and and we've got institutions where they're taking open seriously open work is a core value what does that institution look like say in 2035 what does a what does a college or university look like after you know after doing open work for some period of time how I, might I, I think it's it's more broadly diverse, open and equitable, mm. right? So, I mean, we all talk about Boyer all the time, Boyer and his okay. magical categories of scholarship. But at the end of the day, the only one that most institutions really put the pedal to the metal on is on Einstein-like scholarship discovery, right? And if, you know, there's, there's a strong link between open scholarship and what Boyer laid out in the first place, if people just took those models seriously, They've been around for what, 30 years more? Um, you, you know, I mean, you can try starting at the top or you can try starting at the bottom, right? If you have one department that says, this is how we're gonna start valuing things and shows success with it and then moves it up to the college, then moves it up to the other levels. And in a perfect world, you have this kind of converging where you've got the upper levels of the institution saying, we actually believe this stuff is important. And we want to find ways to help you do this at the individual work level and at the department level. And if you have departments and individuals say, I'm willing or I'm already doing stuff this way, how can you help me move it forward? Then maybe you have a pathway to get to that broadly open and all terms of the world, broadly open, accessible, democratized, equitable support of the work that needs to be done at a university from now on and should have been done a long time ago. Would the, would the boundaries of that university be more permeable than university boundaries normally are? I would hope so. And that goes back to that um, question about multidisciplinary work, right? Mm -hmm. We all get lip service about doing multidisciplinary work. And then we all get told, oh, you're team teaching. So that's only half a course. What are you going to do to make up your other half a course? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, that's another barrier or stumbling block that goes away as be we become more open. Oh, it actually takes multiple people from multiple places to create what we need to create, right? That was one of the issues around games, right? Is, is those are multiple, multi, multidisciplinary works. And how do you identify the one person who's responsible for it all? I think you've, you've just done a couple of things in, in this past hour. I mean, one is you have given us the best exploration of open that I've ever seen or heard. Well, uh, you, you've taken us through through the different types and subtypes of open in ways that I, I don't think I've ever experienced. 
um, you've given us uh, the benefits of your experience of working, uh, doing the work as well as being an activist and a scholar in this field. And you've given us directions forward uh, for all of this. I, I've got to give you our deepest thanks. Um, just a quick note to everyone in the chat. Um, I would love to add this to my uh, to my folder of uh, materials that I would like to publish on the blog. Uh, any of you in the chat have any uh, objections to uh, me uh, publishing your words? I would anonymize them, of course. Uh, and the same is true for everyone who asks questions. Uh, Christopher Dodson and Lisa Sieverts, Tom Hames, and, and Brent Anders. Um, I have a, a, a different question to ask you, Stephen, with which we can end this, which is, how do we keep up with you? What, what, what's the best way to follow your work? Do, should we? Do you have an email newsletter? Should we follow you on LinkedIn or? Um, how? The the Open at RIT website will show you what you're doing. LinkedIn works. Facebook works. Send me email to sj at mail .rit .edu. Any of those things is perfectly acceptable. All right. Well, those should all work. Well, in the meantime, thank you again, Stephen, for a terrific hour. My, um, my pleasure. Please keep up with the great work. Uh, we, we all need to see more and more of this, and hopefully more and more of us can participate in it as we go. Thanks for your time, folks. Thank you so much. And thank you all for uh, really, really good questions and really good thoughts. This, this feels like a, a seminar on open, and that we have a lot of really, really good information. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this in various venues, which have various degrees of openness, um, we have uh, all kinds of venues on the socials, uh, from my blog to, of course, Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions having to do with open in all of these different ways, just take a look back at our archive, tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. If you'd like to look ahead to our sessions on other topics involving the future of higher education, from enrollment to grading to diversity to the future workforce, decolonizing higher education and enrollment, please just go to our website at forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again for thinking uh, together. This has been a terrific session. Uh, I feel like we've really learned a great deal and we have a lot of opportunities ahead. Thank you all for being with us. I hope everybody's well this first day of August, 2024. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.